Hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the first post-lunch session. Uh, this panel is titled uh, Representing Marginalities, Images, and Imaginations. And uh, the papers that have been put together in this panel largely uh, talk about uh, questions and issues around representation of marginali marginalities through uh, different uh, forms, narrative forms as well as uh, uh, media forms. Uh, we have uh, three papers today, and uh, the speakers uh, hopefully will demonstrate some of the people's perceptions on uh, uh, places and how materiality is shaped and how it links uh, to issues of urbanization, um, focusing on places such as uh, Sonipat, which is now an emerging private education city located uh, in the uh, peripheries of the NCR region to urban Mumbai and finally to uh, showing and demonstrating how urban mar marginality is represented in literary imagination through the works of uh, Aman Sethi and Sonia Falero. Um, so we'll go in the order of um, uh, of the speakers listed here in the schedule. We'll start with uh, Priyanka Mittal's paper. Priyanka is from Center for the Study of Developing Studies. Over to you, Priyanka. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Priyanka Mittal, and I work with Lokmiti at CSTS, Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. This presentation actually emerges from the ongoing fieldwork that I initially began almost two years ago as part of the TSF India project anchored here at IIHS. During this time, I worked closely with Professor Jyoti, Ruchra, and Chetan, whom, uh, all of whom are sitting here, and we have continued the fieldwork and reading sessions afterwards too. This presentation um, thus draws from my ethnographic engagement with the lives within a Delhi slum, especially those of children, to explore how these lives situated at the margins unfold in relation to the formal world of the city. This research is centered on a slum basti that has a mixed population of about 300 households. This is a JJ basti and is notified. It is one of the middle class areas of Delhi that has government flats in it. This middle class neighborhood colony of government servants is separated from the slum basti through a big wall. This wall hides the slum from the outside. The labyrinth of the streets and the entire world within the basti is not visible. The main entry to the slum is through the wall, which has an opening that takes you inside the basti. The entrance forks itself into three different streets, which are divided along caste and religious lines. Um, and the mobility of adults as well as children is strictly marked by these divisions. The slum is also marked by the strong stench of the drain that flows right through the middle of it and is visible through the homes. Despite marking the entire slum, it is the Dalit households that are identified with this drain. People living on the, the Nala side becomes a term that is used for these households. I will not get into discussing the detailed occupational profile of the inhabitants, but broadly, men primarily work as cleaners, guards, drivers, or construction laborers, and women work as house elves, cooks, cleaners, in parlors, and malls, etc. While the work is located in the slum, it mainly focuses on the children of the Dalit community, most of whom go to the nearby state-run school. On a raised platform between the Bharat Ghar, uh, that is the community center and the public toilet, we had developed a learning center, the picture of which uh, I am showing here. So this raised platform is uh, the learning center where we help children uh, with reading and writing and also engage in interviews with them and the adult members of the community. So on one side uh, of this uh, learning center is the Bharat Ghar, the community center, uh, which is uh, generally closed. And then uh, on the other side uh, is the, uh, the, to the toilet, public toilet uh, construction. Okay, so contrary to the widely perceived assumption uh, that social divisions and hierarchies become less stringent in urbanized environments which are particularly characterized by the ideas of modernity, progress, and meritocracy, there is a growing recognition that in the urban landscape, the experience of exclusion and marginality gets manifested in multifaceted forms as various social axes of class, caste, gender, religion, ethnicity intersect. I would draw upon one of my interactions from the field to discuss how the children engaged in making sense of their experiences around questions of identity. On one of the days uh, when it somehow came up that I belong to Haryana, Sumit, a boy of 17 years of age, said that Sapna Chaudhary, who is a popular Haryanvi dancer, also belongs to Haryana. At this, a girl of 12 or 13 years, Angel, asked my fieldwork partner if he also belonged to Haryana, 
To which he replied that he belongs from Uttar Pradesh. Angel then said, uh, I'll be reading uh, the conversation in Hindi uh, so as to not lose out the texture of the conversation. But I've translated it uh, uh, into English so you can also read it here. So Angel, uh, she said, Hum to Balmiki hai, lucky. Another boy of 15 years of age who has dropped out of school and runs a small stall now in front of his jhuggi then intervenes. Didi, I am Balmiki. At this point, another girl of 15 or 16, Rubina, interrupts Lucky. Balmiki bolna zaruri hai. Sumit then fondly tells me, Didi, aapko pata hai, mein na har roz mandir jata hoon, aur vrat bhi karta hoon, aur subha sham puja bhi. This is followed by the arrival of another boy, prince of about 14 or 15 years of age, who with an air of superiority says, Didi, hum chauhan hai, sabse zada bade insaan. हमारी मैम बोल रही थी कि चौहान की इज्जत बहुत ज्यादा होती है मैम यह भी कह रही थी कि चौहान ना बहुत ज्यादा वो होते हैं टू व्हिच आई आस्क्ड क्या प्रिंसेस सिस्टर एंजल देन सेड बड़ी जाति के प्रिंस कंटिन्यूड हां बड़ी जाति के और ना बहुत ऊंचे खानदान के भी बहुत ज्यादा इज्जत की जाती है चौहानों की वन दिस फाइंड्स अ कांस्टेंट नेगोशिएशन विद कास्ट अमंग दीस चिल्ड्रन एज दे ट्राई टू अफर्म देयर कास्ट आइडेंटिटी बट आल्सो डिसोसिएट विद इट एट द सेम टाइम in one of the other instances, Simran, a girl of 16 years of age, who lives in this neighborhood with her maternal aunt due to some conflicts with her own parents, expressed one day, Dekho didi, apni padhai puri karke, mehnat karke, kaam pe lagna zaruri hai. Ab padhai nahi karenge, to paisa kahan se laenge? Paisa padhai karke, karne, padhai karke naukri karne mein, aur bina padhai ki naukri karne mein antar hai. Agar hum thode padhe likhe honge, to humari izzat hoegi, अब हम गवार रहेंगे तो दुनिया तो कहेगी ना ए चल जा बर्तन मांज इज्जत कहां होती है उसमें एट दिस प्रिंस कंटिन्यूड भाई जो लोग पढ़ना जानते हैं उनकी ही इज्जत होती है बस बट देन ही टुक अ ब्रीफ थॉटफुल पॉज एंड सेड पर दीदी वैसे आज ना पढ़े लिखों की भी कोई इज्जत और नौकरी नहीं है मेरे एक सौतेले चाचा हैं वो 12वीं पास हैं पर उनको कोई काम पे नहीं रख रहा और अब वो बेलदारी का काम करते हैं सो देयर इज अ सर्टेन इमेजिनेशन attached with education that comes to the fore in this conversation. One can find Simran invoking the promise of education to possibly shift her from the illegitimate, invalid, inferior zone of the margins, as reflected in her usage of the words gamar, bartan manj, bina padhai ki naukri, to the respectful, rational world of the city, reflected in words like izzat, padhai karke naukri karna. So on one hand exists an aspiration of social mobility and right to the city, but on the other hand also exists a disillusionment with this promise, as was reflected in what Prince said. I will now discuss how while trying to find some kind of belongingness with the city, the child and adults of the Basti have also internalized the dominant middle class sensibilities through which they are seen by the city. This gets reflected in what Lucky said to me uh, while two other boys were fighting. Didi, apna bura mat manna. Par is jhuggi mein koi bhi sharif nahi hai. Ye na kahi bhi jate hai, to apni jhuggi jhopri wali harkate zarur dikhate hai. Gali bakna, marna, peetna, paise maangna, hai hai karke. Bas yehi sab aata hai inhi. Similarly, Ravi, a middle-aged man who maintains a nearby public toilet, uh, which I talked about earlier, he talked to us regarding his children. Madam, main inko badalna chahata hu. Main chahata hu ki ye padhe likhe dikhai de. Koi mujhe dekh ke ye nahi keh sakta ki main school nahi gaya. Main English bhi bol leta hu. लेकिन इनको ऐसे ही गंदा बनके रहना है मैं इन्हें समझा समझा के थक गया वन कैन क्लियरली सी रवीज डेस्परेशन टू सीक प्रॉक्सिमिटी विद व्हाट लुक्स वैल्यूड इन द एक्सेप्टेड कोड्स ऑफ विजुअल अपीयरेंस लाइक लुकिंग क्लीन एजुकेटेड इंग्लिश स्पीकिंग सो एज टू गेन लेजिटिमेसी इन हिज डिजायर ऑफ नॉट बीइंग सीन एज अ न्यूसेंस बट रादर अ राइटफुल एलाय इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ सिटी मेकिंग इन दिल्ली as Gertner argues, sensory codes of appearance or aesthetics as a dominant political sensibility has gained traction in the modern times so as to order and discipline the urban population. Thus, the inhabitants, the attempts of inhabitants of the Basti to partake in this process of city making involve desperately distancing themselves from those images that are associated with their own symbolic realm in the popular consciousness and seeking closeness and familiarity with those images that represent the clean, beautiful, and orderly world of the legitimate members of the city. I'll share a few instances from my fieldwork to dwell on this line of thought. Lucky was once telling me about his aunt's wedding. Didi, meri anju bua ki shadi ke time pe, humne bhandara bhi kiya tha garib bachcho ke liye. Ye paaswala mandir hai na, mahi pe. 
in one of the other instances he was talking about a girl who got kidnapped from under the flyover which is just adjacent to this basti didi aapko pata hai yahan pul ke niche se 3 saal ki ek ladki kidnap ho gayi wo pul ke niche ghoom rahi thi ek bike wala aaya usne ladki ko bulaya ki cheez dunga ab aapko to pata hi hai ki ren basere ke chote bacche kaise hote hain cheez wheez ke chakkar mein to wo chali gayi bike wale ke paas aaj tak nahi mili didi wo ab hame kya pata use kaat koot ke usse bheek mangwa rahe ho one finds lucky trying to dissociate and alienate himself from the images of garib or ren basere ke bacche bodies which closely constitute his own social world too on one of our other field visits we came across a girl of about 18 years of age varsha who lives in another part of the slum and asked us why we largely sit near the nala sewage drain the nala side only and that we should come to her side of the slum too she shared that she had been working as a house help as well as a beauty parlor girl but that there wasn't much money or respect in these jobs and thus she wanted to learn english as fast as she can to find better jobs mujhe na jaldi se jaldi english seekhni hai maine classes bhi join kar li hain par mere paas yahan practice karne ke liye koi hai nahi yahan ke log na aise hi hain ab aap aur main to samajhte hain ye sari baatein it is interesting to note how during this conversation she kept creating a distinction between herself and the basti yahan yahan ke log while simultaneously invoking a proximity with us aap aur main you and i who might likely represent to her the image of an educated english speaking legitimate body of the city that she aspires to achieve on another day i and a few other children decided to walk with an 11 year old boy ashik to his house since he wasn't feeling like going home and getting his notebook for studying so while we were talking arjun a boy of about 14 years of age said to me while pointing to ashik abhishek and avinash दीदी ये सारे जितने भी तीनों हैं ना ये भीख मांगते हैं बत्ती पे और फिर ये लोग रैन बसेरे पे चले जाते हैं जब इनकी मम्मी काम पर जाती है एन इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग टू नोट हियर इज हाउ द चिल्ड्रेन ट्राई टू अचीव अ सेंस ऑफ डिसोसिएशन फ्रॉम द स्लम बाय क्रिएटिंग इंटरनल डिस्टिंगशन विद इन द बस्ती सो वट वी अंडरस्टैंड इज मार्जिन गेट्स रीस्ट्रक्चर रीसेंटर बाई क्रिएटिंग देयर ओन मार्जिन these inter- internal distinctions are created across numerous points those who have a beautiful handwriting and those who don't those who look look clean and tidy and those who look unkempt those who read and write and those who cannot those who can go to school those who cannot and similar distinctions i'm not getting into all of them in the interest of time uh, their desire for the large part seems to be anchored on how they look or appear gartner observes how those at the margins try to claim a part in the whole by trying to align themselves with the aesthetics that are accepted and approved by the city it is in this discussion that i situate uh, my interest in the question of images i attempt to draw from lacanian conception of fragmented ego and specular image to explore the tension between the city and the margins in his essay on the mirror stage lacan articulates how the inner and outer worlds of human beings never correspond completely and thus we need certain images to mediate through reality these specular images are situated in our imaginary realm and which help us navigate through our fundamental fragmentation and the trying to formulate how a specular image always exists for the margins too for example the image of a world class city or that of an educated english speaking body i am reminded of when lucky expressed his desire to visit my house and see where i live or when khushbu studies in 8th grade said to me mujhe aapke jaisa banna hai i'm just winding up मुझे आपके जैसा बनना है आपके जैसी इंग्लिश बोलनी है आई वॉन्ट टू बिकम लाइक यू स्पीक इंग्लिश लाइक यू बट हाउ अ सिम्बॉलिक फ्रेमवर्क अ ग्रामर रूटेड इन रियालिटी डज नॉट एग्जिस्ट फॉर द मार्जिन टू अचीव अर गो क्लोजर टू दोज इमेजेस द वर्ल्ड ऑफ द बस्ती डज नॉट हैव एनी सिम्बॉलिक फ्रेमवर्क टू अचीव अ बिलोंगिंगनेस विद द सिटी एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ विच इट गेट्स ट्रैप्ड इन मियरली इमेज बेस्ड आइडेंटिफिकेशन एज अ रिजल्ट दीज इमेज बेस्ड आइडेंटिफिकेशन बिकम एन एम टी और डिफ्यूज सिग्निफायर in such a discourse perhaps the interaction of margins with the city then becomes an interaction through images how do we think through this question what can these images show to us about the aesthetic turn that governmentality has taken thank you thank you priyanka uh, thank you for that paper which is rich in uh, anecdotes as well as theorization of the image uh, through lacan um let's move to the second presentation uh, which is uh, on how short form content app transformed the shape of mumbai's marine drive by apurva shandilya from manipal university thank you ms sagar thank you ms smital for your presentation 
uh, I must admit, I both wish I was at the conference and uh, got the chance to actually make a presentation for this. While I have neither one of those two things, I must admit the motivation behind the actual paper itself emerged from my first visit to Mumbai earlier last year in January when my dad moved to uh, the very end of Mumbai, which is at Melman Point, right? Uh, in my arrival there, I realized that my literature degree and an absence of uh, formal education in urban design or any urban planning at all revealed things that I have simply never observed. I was unfamiliar with the rules of Mumbai. Why is it that autos and buses, among other forms of transportation, are not allowed beyond a certain point? Beyond the ceiling, particularly, where the point for buses and autos stop and only cabs and cars and personal vehicles are allowed, there is a peculiar reason that the state itself provides us. At the end, there are three particular categories that come into the play in terms of why is it that this particular uh, distinction between the spaces in South Bombay exists. For me, these three categories that, that got revealed after research were, well, personal wealth, accessibility, and geographical territory. Of course, words that don't need any explanation, but have a lot of nuance behind them, particularly that which comes with accessibility. With South Bombay, particularly Marine Drive, which is the question that my paper poses to what, what it means to own public spaces in Mumbai um, has only two ways of access. One is a private vehicle that allows you to come visit the marine drive, and the other is the public local transportation. Of course, Churchgate Station, which is the one that is the closest to marine drive, allows for open free access, which is fairly cheap for, to all of Mumbai. However, a simple point of distinction there becomes the amount of wealth that you own on a personal level. Without that wealth, you do not have access to those parts of Mumbai that don't allow any other kinds of movement. In the absence of the kind of movement that is restricted due to the way the urban spaces in South, South Mumbai is constructed, I, my paper was an exploration or is an exploration of what resulted in this new built environment within South Bombay. Well, one, first of all, was an imitation or a desire to imitate the, the, the cities of, of the West. In imitating New York, in imitating Paris, South Bombay led a wide connections of urban growth in terms of the fact that apartments and other forms of construction now removed artifacts or places that represent the aesthetics of a city. Unlike even cities like Bombay or Calcutta or Madras, which have all had inherent architectural distinction when compared to almost any other city in the world, Mumbai's architecture is, well, nothing. And while I understand that when I say the aesthetics of Mumbai itself is nothing, it might create a lot of irony, but my own paper talks about the aesthetics of Mumbai being the same as the aesthetics of the rich. In saying, and what I define as aesthetics of the rich, I speak about primarily two things. One, as you sit in a space and occupy a space like the Marine Drive, on your east, you see the Arabian Sea, an empty, vast space that's inaccessible to just about each one of us. On the other hand, you see large, well-constructed buildings, far too, far too inaccess inaccessible to anyone but the Uber rich, or the hotels that simply will not allow you entry for the kind of clothes that you wear and the way that you try to enter them. This particular distinction is also marked significantly well and defined particularly well in literature that has defined what Bombay has looked like. My earliest exam, my earliest own reading of this was Gregory David Roberts' Shantaram. And but Shantaram defines Bombay as a space that's defined by the people who live in Bombay and not the architecture itself. The choice that Robert lives in while he's in uh, Mumbai from his visit to, not from his visit, but from his uh, time in Australia, uh, he defines Mumbai as being defined by those who live in the Chals. This is not a relationship that's constructed out of even kinship, but simply the spaces that the Chals force you in. In limited space beyond the south of Bombay, in the suburbs, Bombay then gets defined by those who live in Bombay, not the space itself, not the actual architecture, 
not the challs, not the taller buildings, not the expensive aesthetics of the rich. However, in more recent uh, work, what Bombay has emerged out as, what Bombay has definitely emerged as, is a very clear distinction between what is public and what is private. However, in this modern depiction of what Bombay should look like and what Bombay is now, what Bombay does look like, urban spaces, particularly urban public spaces, have removed all forms of artifacts that represent Bombay as a city with its own distinct, let's say, flair, and replaced it with what I call non-places, or what these or past literatures already coined as non-places. Places that very distinctly are made for a singular group that is well-defined by its own community. These self-serving groups then have created liminal spaces or have inverted, inadvertently created liminal spaces that belong not only to the ones who have made it or have constructed it, but, are, but distinctly separate those who cannot own access to it or cannot access it even in its physical uh, limitations. Towards the later half of my own research behind what is it that defines public spaces in Mumbai and particularly in South Mumbai, uh, I noticed the changes uh, there's also a lot of research, obviously, on modern, extremely modern work in terms of architecture in South Bombay, in terms of how the coastal road itself has been envisioned, as well as the Atul uh, Bridge that got inaugurated yesterday. What has happened is that even new developing architecture within the space of Bombay allows for more and more private ownership of these spaces, and much less ownership of a public space that belongs to everybody, that belongs to not just those who live in this limited three kilometer radius, but far beyond the suburbs. So as far as Thane, which then get to access a space like Money Drive only over the weekends. Now, when I say that those who live beyond the beyond the limitations of South Bombay get to access Marine Drive over the weekend, this is not a clear distinction that was one of interest to me. Instead, what was of interest to me is when people do access a space like this, you access it as a spectator without having ownership of any private space within this part of Bombay. You are a voyeur. You either can view the sea on your east or towards the west, which is the aesthetic of the rich. In the absence of the, in absence of either, you do not and will not, do not get to become a participant, participant of this actual space itself, simply a viewer. What has transformed this, however, over the last couple of years, is access to both the internet as well as cheap access to phones. In, in making um, devices and mediums like phones as well as things like Instagram, TikTok, Mooj, other smaller apps that replicated TikTok after it gone banned in India, what has happened is it has allowed a new medium for those who don't own private, don't have private ownership of South Bombay to have a new kind of ownership of the Marine Drive. This ownership is driven by very simply the direction and the production of content that these apps allow you to produce and consume on these spaces. Through the consumption and the direction of these content, these spaces suddenly now allow you to not just view and spectate it, spectate those who own what is South Bombay, uh, but instead become a participant of the same culture or the cultural phenomenon that Marine Drive earlier or what Marine Drive has, or the cultural phenomenon that Marine Drive is building around it. In saying that, in in the belong in 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 the change that happens in the belonging of what the space and who owns the space, what also what is also a result of this is those who otherwise owned access to this limited private uh, this limited public space now cannot uh, do not. Uh, cannot claim ownership of the space anymore as something that inherently belongs to a singular oneness community or a single singular community. Instead, it has opened up, at least the apps themselves have opened up a public space like the Marine Drive to everybody, allowing access through a medium that's otherwise for not, not meant for, well, third spaces particularly or public spaces like the Marine Drive. At the end, my actual research itself is simply a study of how is it that popular culture itself and the dissemination as well as consumption, dissemination as well as consumption of popular culture has transformed how 
we view the actual space of the marine drive and not so much the act, the, the the transformation of the space itself but simply changing marine drive into an artifact through the medium of apps like tiktok moch and instagram reels thank you thank you apur fantastic um, and thank you for showing us the stark transformation of M mumbai's aesthetics into uh, that of uh, the imagination of the rich um, so over to the next paper uh, by Marianne Hillian. Uh, the paper is titled Visibilizing Marginalized Lives in Delhi and Mumbai Through Literary Nonfiction, The Case of Amen Sethi and Sonia Faleri. Hello everyone, I'm Marianne from the University of Strasbourg in France. And um, so thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to present this work in progress here and to have your feedback, hopefully. So this paper looks at the ways in which literary nonfiction in English represents social and spatial marginalization in urban India. Let me start with telling you briefly where I speak from. I look at urban space in India through the lens of literature, fiction and nonfiction. So since the 2000s, we have witnessed the rise of urban literary nonfiction or nonfiction of the city. As you can see here, it assumes various forms from city biographies, the specific collection uh, published by Aleph in 2013, anthologies, memoirs, essays, reportages, and so on. Some of these books focus on the urban experience of the middle class or of the elite, often from the perspective of foreign returned writers, such as Rana Dasgupta's Capital, about Delhi, or Amit Chowdhury's Kolkata. Others, uh, a number of them actually, are drawn to the working class uh, or to the majority of precarious urban dwellers who are often erased from other narratives and from public space altogether. So you have a few examples here. Um, this paper focuses on Sonia Falero's Beautiful Thing and on Amen City's A Free Man, both published in 2010. There are two literary reportages written by journalists in English, which explore the everyday life of one city dweller. So Amen City tries to understand the daily life and work of Mohammed Ashraf, a Bihari construction worker living in the streets of Sadar Bazar in North Delhi. He started living there after the destruction of his settlements on the Yamuna River Bank in, in 2004, uh, which was part of a wide slum clearance campaign, which is well known uh, to social scientists here. Sonia Falero, on the other hand, uh, charts the path of Leela, a bar dancer, a 19-year-old woman from Meerut who fights her way, through the, her way through the dance bar line in Mumbai. She lives and works in Mira Road. Uh, she's quite successful in the, in the dance bar line until the 2005 Bombay Police Act, um, which banned bar dancing in Mumbai, deprived her of livelihood. Then she takes shelter in a working class settlement and probably moves to Dubai, even though uh, this is quite uncertain. Now, while Sonia Falero thinks of her book as a political intervention in the aftermath of this ban, uh, it's not the case of Amon City. And I'll, I can give you more detail about that a bit later. So although they address different uh, so sociological profiles in terms of gender, in terms of income, both writers explore urban precarity. And I think this term captures the insecure livelihood of these uh, people, but also their uncertain place in the city. Um, the fact that their lives are vulnerable both to state violence and market violence. Now the history of the term precarity is quite long and I won't dwell on that um, because of time limits. Uh, but I borrow it from uh, a researcher called Om Prakash Dvivedi, who used it in a South Asian context. Now, these two books address urban precarity in a very specific way. They map um, urban precarity through a very narrow scope, at the scale of the neighborhood, at the scale of the individual, right? They do not explore the city overall, but have, yeah, a very particular use of, of scale. They also share a similar restrained tone, uh, staying away from pathos or tragedy. Now, there are many pitfalls or dangers uh, in, term, in aesthetic, in ethical and political terms uh, when uh, non-precarious writers, for lack of a better word, uh, represent urban precarity. In this case, we're talking about English-speaking middle-class journalists 
um, who address an Indian readership, but also global readership, because these books have been published in India and then in the UK and the US. So one of these pitfalls is, um, so you have a list here, um, the term slumming has been used by Rangini Srinivasan uh, with regards to Suketumeta's maximum city, but you can also talk about poverty spectatorship or obje objectification, class ethnocentrism. Centrism. One of these pitfalls is the hero-victim binary. My point in this paper is to show that these two narratives manage to escape these traps, and in particular, the hero-victim binary, through the hybrid form they come up with. I think this echoes the conversations we've had for today's about um, researchers' approach of marginalities, and I think in that sense, literary texts can also perhaps shed light on the methods of social sciences. Uh, the questions I'm asking here is, what are the literary strategies these writers develop to engage with the question of urban precarity, and what are the effects of this hybrid form, and in particular of this individual focus um, that they develop? So because of time limits, I'll just give a brief overview of four main arguments of this paper, and I'll give a few examples, but I would happily give more detail in the Q&A, and uh, I would also happily circulate the text in which the examples are fully examined. So my first argument is that these writers use a hybrid narrative form to foreground their protagonist's agency. They use both ethnographic narrative methods and novelistic methods. So when I talk about ethnographic narrative methods, I'm referring to uh, transcription of interviews, notes from their participant observation, thick description of the street corner or tea shop, uh, of a particular building in which the dancers live, uh, a meticulous account of the social hierarchies of the construction line or of the bar dancing line, various techniques of work which are detailed in the text itself. And in particular, um, attention to speech style, to language, to the local slang um, that these protagonists use. They also use novelistic method. Um, you, for instance, writing scenes from the character's past that they have not witnessed, that the writers have not witnessed, through an internal viewpoint giving access to the individual psyche, right? And this overlap uh, between a factual and a fictional regimes, I think helps them be as close as possible to the protagonist's own perception of uh, themselves and to express the way they make sense of their own condition. So I'll just give you a quick example here uh, about the novelistic or fictional narrative methods that Aman Sethi uses in A Free Man. Uh, in this case, and I, I'll let you read the excerpt, um, Ashraf is late for work. He missed uh, a day of work in Mumbai where he works as a butcher, and he's running to the butcher's shop, um, worried about uh, his boss's response. And as you can see here, uh, the, the writer uses free and direct speech. It's an interior monologue. It's almost like a stream of consciousness, um, expressing the sensations of the characters, his panic, mixing uh, Hindi fragments uh, in this English text. This scene in the book is not contextualized. There's no uh, explanation about the origins of, of, this, um, of this scene. It reads like fiction. And I think that um, this crossing of the boundary between you know, fact and fiction gives intensity to the narrative. It also allows the reader to empathize with the laborer and to give the protagonist own reconstructed, of course, perception of events. I think what is prominent in, their, in the protagonist's narratives of themselves, whether that of the, lay, the construction worker or of the bar dancer, is the idea of agency and of independence. Both of them articulate a discourse about their own socioeconomic condition that is pervaded by the ideal of independence. Leela, in the case of um, Sonia Fairo's narrative, is portrayed as a fearless individual the text underlines her, her fearlessness, her determination, and she insists on the sense of autonomy that she derives from working and from earning her own money. Uh, she also insists on the power she has over customers, um, and it also impacts the way she perceives her own body. Um, I think, yes. Um, she explains to the reporter, to the writer, every life has its benefits, 
I make money and money gives me something my mother never had, a zadi, freedom. And if I have to dance for men so I can have, so I can have it, okay, then I will dance for men. The world Azadi also recurs in Ashraf's discourse about his own life. He says the ideal job has the perfect balance of Kamai and Azadi, money and freedom. In fact, Ashraf is not a very hardworking laborer. He's not presented as such. He doesn't portray himself as such. He doesn't seem to want to escape his condition as a street dweller. And he presents daily wage work as a choice. So he portrays himself as a sort of adventurer, a philosopher detached from the pursuit of material wealth. Now, my second point is that why, uh, why two minutes? OK. Um, uh, my second point is that while these narratives underline the protagonist's agency and autonomy, um, they do not downplay the domination processes that partly shape the contours of this autonomy. They, they uncover the protagonist's vulnerability and the structural inequalities that shape their autonomy. So the two texts expose the, the rigged economic competition at work in urban India, but they do so in distinct ways. So just to summarize this point, I will just say that in, on the one hand, Ashraf is portrayed as um, you know, someone who's detached from the pursuit of material wealth, and at the same time, this, this, this opting out of the race for economic success is not represented as some form of idealism, but as a pragmatic resignation to an, an, an even power balance. On the other hand, Leela is represented as a fighter, a sort of warrior, uh, determined to earn um, more money, uh, but in the end, the narrative also reads as the narrative of a crushed warrior because the competition is so uneven and because of, the, of state violence. Um, a point that I will skip, but we can come back to that in the question, is the unbridgeable gap between writer and protagonist. I think these narratives are also interesting because they register the fact that they register the uneven power relationship tying the writer to the protagonist. And they also underline the limitations of their own perspective and of their own project. The world they explore remains partly opaque to them. And I think that even though it's not self-representation that I'm talking about, I think the very fact that they reflect on their own position is something. And finally, perhaps I'll, I'll conclude with this, with perhaps one limit that I identify in these narratives is that their focus on uh, the individual um, you know, leads them to, uh, to single out a unique, isolated trajectory and to emphasize the antagonism between the individual and society, perhaps at the expense of existing collective practices and collective solidarities. Uh, there's one example that I could develop later, but in the case of Sonia Farero, the, bar the Indian Bar Girls Union, uh, a union which was instrumental in the striking down of the ban on bar dancing is only alluded to in the narrative. Uh, so I think that that is one, um, that is what this form is doing. That is perhaps the political effect of this form and perhaps the, the limited politi political effect of this form is that they really, um, they're foreground the antagonism between you know, individual and society, perhaps at the expense of the collective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne, for showing us the interesting characteristics of the literary strategies used by writers uh, to represent um, uh, the slums. Um, and um, so let's uh, start with uh, some of the questions uh, from the audience uh, for the three panelists. Uh, hi, uh, so my question is to for Apoor. Uh, maybe I didn't, I missed a point or something. Uh, were you saying that Bombay or Mumbai, uh, the architecture of Mumbai never had any character or was there some point of time when it lost it? And if it did, what was the point when they, it became non-spatial? Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, if you can uh, throw some light at it. And the second thing about uh, people going on Juhu Beach and accessing it. Well, I have a photo from my childhood at Juhu Beach. I've never lived in Mumbai. So perhaps it was always used in a way that way and just the intensity of it increased with availability of uh, 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 with, uh, with camera phones. And as camera became very totalitarian technology, mm, the 
people started using it. So maybe if you can throw a bit light on that, uh, the point that I missed. And for Priyanka, I wanted to know uh, these children who sort of distanced from the Joggi Jopri Basti and everything, uh, do they bring their family in that distance that me and, uh, or how do they connect with the family? Is the family of the Joggi Jopri at large or their family and they are different from the rest of that Joggi Jopri? If, if it uh, came up during, if you can shed some light on that. So yeah, that's it. We'll take a few more questions and then uh, seek your responses. So my question is to Marianne. Uh, I was just interested in how you selected the books that you, uh, you know, saw to. Uh, I, I felt like not. I, I'm not familiar with this with any of this literature. Mm -hmm. um, I basically don't have any life after PhD, evidently. But um, there was something very spatially similar also in the places that they occupied, mm -hmm. um, both your protagonists. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like. Um, how did you select these books? Like, did you have also some idea of the kind of spatiality that produces marginality, for example, um, or maybe some other literary trend? Uh, yeah, just not a very fully formed question, but yeah, something along those lines. I wanted to ask. Uh, Priyanka, uh, your uh, so you were uh, referring to Ghatna's text. Could you tell which one and why? Uh, looking as uh, at aesthetics, uh, I'm looking at very similar things. Probably your and my sight would be the same. I, I'm not too sure, uh, but I came across everything very similar. Like how they talk about the culture in the slum, gali bakte hain, daru pite hain, jhagda karte hain. A very similar narrative and uh, a, a narrative of upward mobility where they value the fact that you are English speaking and education, but how it still doesn't work for them. So very similar narratives that I've used uh, in the synthesis of the anecdote that I found in the field, like how to understand that with, uh, and I connected it with Mahol. Uh, it's a work by Sviti Ganguly. She writes about, writes about Mahol in a Balmiki colony. Uh, and I found that generative for me but you use Gartner's work. So could you talk a little bit about that, which text you use, and why is aesthetics a generative lens for you to look at these findings? Uh, yeah, uh, with uh, Priyanka, perhaps you can go first. Yeah, I think someone took the question or somebody was not Right, right. Apurva, do you want to start with your responses? Sure. I just, because there are two questions, I'll just go one by one. Uh, I, I didn't catch the gentleman's name, but uh, to answer the question about um, Bombay's architecture or Bombay's distinct architecture, I, I think it's on me. Uh, I never meant that Bombay has never ever had a distinct form of architecture that's uniquely its own. Um, that's not the point of the paper and that's certainly not the point I'm trying to make because fundamentally I'm not uh, somebody who's super familiar with uh, the history of Mumbai's architecture particularly. However, I will um, strongly ascertain the fact that when I speak about uh, non-places in particular and about the fact that uh, uh, this transformation of Bombay space into non-places, uh, only let, let's talk only about South Bombay in particular, right? Um, in that limited space, the um, the movement of the crowd or the movement of people itself that has, that has moved away from, let's say, the gateway of India and, and, and the port area back to how the marine drive has gotten, has been constructed, right? Um, it's the actual marine drive itself that I'm posing a question to and calling a non-place. Only because in a space that already has extremely limited public space, if the large, uh, if the large uh, landscape that I've created in South Bombay is simply an empty space that looks at the sea and looks at the uh, buildings on this side, who is it serving? And in my research, or at least as a finding of my research, I believe it simply is serving the same purpose as 
parks that belong to individual communities living in gated communities. And that's exactly what Nadman Point and Marine Drive in its entirety is serving for those who belong and own South Bombay. And that's also the reason why I'm calling Marine Drive a non thing in its absence in, in 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 the absence of any other uh, any other way of occupying or or claiming ownership it doesn't allow you to claim ownership in any other way but that which is why uh, it's termed as a non place the second bit about juhu uh, one i i will say two things one um, i did not want to look at all of bombay particularly for the same reason Second, if I only speak about the space that I was talking about, which is Nani, that Money Min Drive, which is a promenade worth about three kilometers, um, in just that space itself, while I completely agree with you about the fact that access has never been uh, denied to anybody in Mumbai, however, it's the act, it's the ownership bit that I am putting out as a new, as a, as a transformation, not as a result of only TikTok. But because of its because of its dissemination, because of the number of people who then become a participant in the dissemination and the production of such uh, such content, thus transforming the marine drive into an artifact of cultural uh, production and dissemination, which is also the reason why when I speak of Nadiman Point changing or marine drive changing, I don't mean that oh the the those who own South Bombay and I say the word own with 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 a lot of seriousness. Because uh, I, I don't believe that crowd disappears. Only the fact that the ownership then becomes a, a very clear binary. When you have on on weekends or or on holidays when those who have and can access or quite literally can access a space like Nairman Point, the medium of TikTok, the medium of Moj allows you to claim ownership. But on days but on days when they're not there the ownership goes back and the ownership goes back to those who own privately own south bombay uh, thank you um, should i go to yeah priyanka okay uh, yeah uh, so to um, first answer to shashwat's question um, when you talk about uh, if they were also bringing their family into into their attempts to dissociate with uh, dissociate themselves with certain images, um, so uh, yeah, I haven't uh, uh, studied this question much. But uh, as you were asking the question, I was and I was taking time to reflect. Um, so family and uh, and uh, their affirmation of their family and where they come uh, from uh, does come up uh, in the in the conversations and in the reflections from my fieldwork. And it is interesting uh, th that when they talk about, uh, you know, when I was talking about recentering the margins, uh, that how they create internal distinctions so as to separate themselves from the ye aise dikhne wale bache ya jo bhi. So they they are doing this uh, recentering in in uh, in uh, re with respect to the other children, to the others. Ki ye mere padosi hai, iski mummy ye karti hai, aapko pata hi ye karte hai. But the moment uh, uh, you know the 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 other child would say ki teri mummy bhi to ye karti hai. So uh, they would uh, suddenly affirm themselves, and and then they would not, they would not uh, even if the both the mothers are doing the same thing. But when they are talk, when uh, when it comes down to their family, so they affirm it, and and they don't want to dissociate uh, dissociate from that image which they were trying to do earlier, uh, while uh, with respect to the other child or the other family or the neighbor. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, of course, I can obviously think about it more and how they are looking at the family and how this then contradiction. Uh, ki on one hand, they are dissociating and trying to come to certain, close to certain images of the city. But when it comes to their family, so then there is a contradiction arising in this dissociation and coming close. So yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, so ma'am, um, yeah, uh, uh, Sriti Ganguly, I have not uh, 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 like read her work, but I met her in one of the conferences and she talked about this idea of Mahal uh, in that. Um, I, I have used uh, Ghatta's, uh, uh, the seminar work that you were talking to Richard ma'am yesterday about uh, the, uh, the rule by aesthetics. And uh, I pr primarily dwelled uh, on the first chapter. Um, and uh, it's very, uh, it's very uh, uh, coincident, no, I would not say coincidental, but it was, it, it just fell into place. It, when I was reading the text, I was going to the field and I was uh, reading psychoanalysis with Chetan sir. So uh, all of these things just started uh, coming together and, and striking me. For example, um, uh, in the conversation when I was read, uh, writing my field notes, so there was an emphasis on, you know, uh, aapke jaisa hai. they don't say that I have to read it, they say that I have to read it, 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 I have to read it,
सो अदर देर हजबीन की गंदे दिखते हैं मैम आप इनके साथ मत बैठो दूर दूर होके बैठो और ना आप भी गंदे हो जाओगे ऐसे ही दिखते हैं सो देर हैज़ बीन एन एम्फिस ऑन दिखना ऑन द लुकनेस ऑन द अपियरेंस सो सो दिस वॉज सो आई वॉज स्ट्रगलिंग विद दिस क्वेश्चन दैट वॉट इज दिस ऑब्सेशन विद हाउ दे लुक एंड uh then when i uh, read this essay uh, of lakan uh, uh, the middle stage in in that he talks about it in a different context um uh, uh, that uh, you know the idea of an empty signifier uh, there there is a signifier there is a signified if this is a pen this and this uh, this signifies something um uh, but uh, when we say ki world class city ya fir uh, educated person so uh, they they have a signifier but they don't exactly know what uh, what an educated person exactly means uh, when they say ki handwriting i have to have a beautiful handwriting and it uh, the, it is of secondary importance if they can also read what they are writing it it, it is enough if they can copy it, uh, you know from some, some other text beautifully so um uh, be uh, if if they can read flu- fluently even if they don't understand what they are exactly reading so they 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 are trying to chase the signifiers without uh, really uh, developing a symbolic framework to also uh, uh, absorb or to also uh, uh, situate in their uh, symbolic realm the the signified of of that chasing chase being chased signifier um so that is why i called it empty signifier uh, so this is uh, so when i was talk when i was reading uh, lacan and this idea of empty signifier and uh, this fragmentation that exists in our cells and then i try to situate it in the context of margins that there must be some fragmentation that they they, they experience in their everyday lives they might not have the symbolic language to articulate it um but there there is um a, a certain fragmentation uh, and that is, and that is why they they have an uh, uh, emphasis on how they look so they are getting trapped in certain image based identifications uh, it they might not have a real symbolic realm they might not exactly know ki mujhe masters karna hai mujhe exactly ye banna hai they have certain images ki doctor banna hai mujhe ye karna hai so uh, they are trapped in those image based identifications because they don't have a a, a, a medium to to translate it into their symbolic realm um so it it uh, there is no particular reason why i exa- oh, chose ghatner work only it just started coming together for me and it's a question i'm still uh, struggling with so it's not a fully formed idea um but i'm just trying to situate this uh, image and the specular image fragmented ego uh, conception of lacan to understand how we can also look at the tension uh, that exists between the state and the margins so yeah Thank you for your question. Um so the way I selected this text um I so in in my work in my PhD in particular I looked at urban space um in India and is in particular post 1991 uh, post liberalization uh, urban development and even urban development so one um you know one aspect I was looking at is you know whether the city featured prominently in um the novel or the essay uh the novels or the essays i found um so the i guess there's a chronological um limit but there's all, and i was also looking at india's um metro cities delhi mumbai and kolkata and then uh i actually identified two main tra- trends even though it's more of a of a spectrum uh but what i tried to show in my phd is that in some novels and in non-fiction there was a trend that i called tentatively the epic <laughs> representation of of indian cities uh these novels and essays uh you know addressed urban change through a spectacular a rhetoric of spectacle um emphasizing social conflicts um the the you know somehow the monstrous aspect of an even development in these cities now on the other hand and these two books are part of the the other trend uh is what i call in a more ordinary representations of the city uh and again both in novels and in uh reportages or essays um these writers focus on the everyday life and how uh, on how urban inequalities translate into you know seemingly insignificant practices or details and the the tone is different as well the to- the it's more about um the tone is very restrained uh, so these two books are part of the of the second trend uh and these are interesting because they was published in 2010 so that is um 6 years after suketu meta's famous reportage maximum city and was what is interesting is that you know suketu meta is this 
very spectacular narrative, some call it sensationalist narrative about uh, Mumbai, about the underworld of Mumbai. There's a very self-reflexive um, uh, aspect to it because it it's almost, it's quite exoticizing, right? The way it, can, it represents Mumbai is um, openly exaggerated. It's everything is maximum, everything is large scale, everything. And they are a counterpoint to this. They, uh, in, in particular, Sonia Federer's book, you know, she investigates, she documents the life of this bar dancer. And Meta in his book has a whole chapter devoted to a bar dancer in which he clearly objectifies her. He's fascinated with her. He fantasizes about her. And, you know, she takes this and she completely, um, I don't know, reverses the perspective on this woman because she shows labor. She shows how, you know, dancing is, is performance and is, of course, it's a lot of, there's a lot of exploitation happening, but it's, uh, she's trying to, again, to be as close as possible to the dancer's perspective on, um, yeah, on her work. So. All right, are, uh, are there other questions? Yes. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question to Apoor, like just thinking uh, from the response you uh, had for your previous question. So uh, what I could see that you are talking about two uh, sets of people, one who privately owned the beach in terms of the, the rich, and those who could come there for their all the consumption of the media, uh, the apps and the TikTok tick and all those things. But how would you situate the vendors on the marine drive, food sellers? So they also own the space in certain way. So where would you situate them in your uh, discussion? I must admit, I think uh, that's a question that I did not get I, I won't say the time, but rather the, the the ability to be able to address in my paper. However, I think it's certainly something that I would want to read into, particularly because those vendors are obviously not allowed to be there. Uh, they're not there when the cops are there, and they're not there when um, they're not there early in the morning. They're there particularly in the evening when when uh, I don't know if you've visited it in and recently, but there are also people who will give you a head massage if you want a uh, bang at any point. And it's very interesting because they're, they're there until what, 3 a.m. when everybody disappears and the cops mm -hmm. make you leave. Uh, but I'll certainly make sure that I at least try and address it uh, in maybe a finalized version of my paper. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, if there are no other questions, we can conclude this uh, panel. Thank you so much, panelists, and wish you the best.